I'm an archaeologist, so I'm kind of odd. The temple for both ancient Israel and modern Latter-day Saints is the bridge between heaven and earth. The temple. For both ancient Israel and Mormons has always been where God meets man and where they make covenants for both eternity and mortality. Temples are open to priests, both in ancient Israel and to Mormons. Temple building and temple architecture is profound import in these two cultures, so it is not surprising that the architecture of early Israelite temple and Mormon temples is strikingly similar. Analogous architectural features are present in both. The Israelite temple built in Jerusalem by Solomon has long been recognized as the crowning achievement of Israelite building in the 10th century. The Solomonic temple's architectural design, building materials, procedures, and dedication rites are given in a general description manner in 1 Kings chapter 6 through 9. These descriptions were never intended to give complete and detailed information. Because they are not complete, further descriptions and detailed reconstructions have been postulated and debated literally for hundreds of years by various scholars. Some descriptions were based in physical fact, and some were very imaginative. Each construct reconstruction relies heavily upon aesthetics and is based on the assumption that the architecture of the Temple of Solomon was copied from temples, houses, or palaces extant in other areas of the Middle East. Not that they were not influenced by the architecture of their day, but it is not to contemporary aesthetics that one should look to see the patterns found in the temple. One should look to Mount Sinai, the literal mountain of the Lord. In the book of Exodus, children of Israel arrived at Mount Sinai to become a kingdom of priests and an holy nation unto the Lord. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore... If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Moses returned to the Israelite camp, set the boundaries, cleansed the people, including washing themselves and their clothes, taught them the requirements to meet their God, and designated those who would ascend up the mountain into the presence of the Lord. Chapter 20 of Exodus records the basic laws and rules for a nation to become a nation of priests or a holy nation. It records the relationship of the Israelites to their God. The Lord then showed his power, and the people were so struck with fear at the awesome experience that they pled with Moses to speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. But the revelatory pattern was set for Israel. Israel went to the mountain of the Lord to meet God, to receive blessings, make covenants, and be sanctified. Eventually Moses, with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Yahshua, and 70 of the elders of Israel ascended the mountain. Israel came to the holy mountain. The priests the el- and elders entered the holy mountain, but only the prophet, the great high priest, the son, could ascend the mountain into the divine presence. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went in into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mountain. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Once Israel left the borders of Mount Sinai, they needed a way to carry the covenant and conversation narrative with them. And thus the tabernacle, Israel's bridge from the mount to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem at the town of Solomon, became a literal reflection of the representation of Sinai. As Milgram states, Mount Sinai is the archetype of the tabernacle and is similarly divided into three gradations of holiness. Its summit is the Holy of Holies. God's voice issues forth from there, as from the inner shrine. The second division of Sinai is the equivalent of the outer shrine, marked off from the rest of the mountain by being enveloped in a cloud, just as the cloud overshadows the entirety of the tabernacle. Below the cloud is the third division, called the bottom of the mountain, a technical term of the lowest portion of the mountain. It is the equivalent to the courtyard, the sacred enclosure of the tabernacle, to which priests alone have access except for the forecourt entrance where the layman brings his sacrifice, provided 
he is in a pure state. Thus the blazing summit, the cloud-covered slopes, and the visible bottom rim correspond to the tabernacle divisions and the architectural divisions of the Israelite sanctuaries or temples which have been ex excavated. When Israel constructed its tabernacle, it was done by revelation from the Lord. Exodus chapters 25 through 40 describe the purpose, details, and construction of the tabernacle, which was to be the sanctuary of the Lord. This traveling divine dwelling place had the power and glory of the original Mount Sinai as a constant reminder of the God of Israel. Israel dwelt in tribes around it with the priestly orders in their appropriate places, and the altars, tables, and offerings showing and typifying the principles and covenants made by the Lord in Israel. The tabernacle was a tangible symbol in its intricate parts, form, and purpose of the covenant made on Sinai. And just like the tabernacle, when Israel built her sanctuaries in Arad, Beersheba, and Jerusalem, they used the pattern of the Sinai theophany and the tabernacle to manifest the covenant. Between 1962 and 67, Yohanan Aharoni and Ruta Amiran conducted excavations at Tel Arad. Seven of those strata, 12 through 6, were of Israelite origin. The temple at Arad started in stratum 11, dated to Solomon's time, and ended in stratum 7 during the reign of Josiah. The temple of Arad was a king sanctuary oriented on an east-west axis, incorporated in the new royal fortress at Arad, which had no preceding city or sanctuary. The sanctuary is thus shown to have been an authorized royal sanctuary in the 10th century. Though the Arad temple does not follow the exact architectural dimensions of the courtyard, the inner court, or Lam, the sanctuary, or Hekal, and the Holy of Holies, the Debir, of the Jerusalem temple, its structure, its structure does contain each feature. The courtyard of the temple was quite large, with a Levitical-sized stone altar for burnt offerings, standing in a corner. The altar measurements of a square of five cubits followed the measurements of the altar of the tabernacle and the original altar of the Temple of Solomon. The size and shape of the Arad altar corresponds exactly to the measurements given in Exodus. Further, the Arad altar was crowned with a large flint slab surrounded by two plastered gutters, probably for the blood of the animal sacrifices. The altar was built of small unhewn stones in contrast to the wall behind, which had many dressed stones. Certainly the use of small unhewn stones followed the injunction given in Exodus 20:25, 20, If thou wilt make of me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. After its initial construction, the altar was destroyed and repaired a number of times. It is significant that each time the altar was repaired, it retained the same dimensions and was never resized for convenience or fashion. Beyond the altar, in the inner court, the ulam of the temple, before the doorway of the vestibule, or the Hekal, stood pillar bases that undoubtedly were for the Yakin and Boaz pillars. This placement varied from many of the reconstructions of the Temple of Solomon, which would place them before the ulam and not before the Hekal. This placement gives an insight into the Temple of Solomon, for it was between Yaquin and Boaz that the veil of the temple hung. We see from the architecture of a rod that priests entering the Hekal of the sanctuary presented themselves in power so that they could enter into the presence of the Lord. For them, the holy place was the second division of Sinai, marked off by the cloud into which the priests and the 70 elders were allowed to ascend. The Hekal of Arad was a broad room instead of a long room, as in the Solomonic Temple, but had exactly the same width as the Solomonic Hekal, 20 cubits. This room and the courtyard had ancillary rooms, which were used to prepare for the rituals, etc. Beyond that, the Holy of Holies had three steps leading up to it. Two stone carved altars with traces of incense were found on the second step. Two stone pillars, Matzavot, were found in the Holy of Holies. The size of the Holy of Holies never changed from the strata 11 through 6. It would have served as a place of worship for the high priest on the Day of Atonement. A rod shows the pattern established by the tabernacle. In 1973, a large building constructed on an east-west axis 
was excavated at Beersheba. I got stuck with that building. This palatial building revealed four main rooms, a very large courtyard and two basements. It was surprising in size and workmanship. The building was given the final locus number 32 and described as follows. This structure with its two deep basements was built in stratum 2, the 8th century. It was destroyed by Sennacherib, 701 BCE. Its builders excavated a huge pit about 12 meters by 17 meters, going down 3 meters or more to bedrock and thereby obliterating all traces of the underlying, underlying strata. There's no other instance of such a building operation anywhere else in Beersheba or in fact in any other contemporary site. Building 32 became the center of a debate about the location and destruction of the temple at Beersheba. However, there was little doubt that the Israelite temple of Stratum 3 and earlier was situated where building 32, which was from Stratum 2, was located. First it occupied the only space large enough to house a sanctuary and was in the most prominent location on the western part of the Tel. Second, the plans of Israelite Beersheba Stratum 2 reveal building 32 as the only building in Beersheba on an east-west axis. An important find under the courtyard added further evidence that building 32 was located on an earlier Israelite temple site. The courtyard of building 32 was made of dust and ashes, the typical road material used in Beersheba. But something very different about the very impressive chalk floor under the courtyard of building 32, which dates to stratum 3, unlike the rooms of building 32, the courtyard did not obliterate all traces of previous strata, and enough of this chalk paving remained to enable one to observe where it was cut by the walls of building 32's courtyard. This white chalk floor was not utilized by the building builders of 32, but its foundations, where the, where the altar of the earlier Israelite sanctuary stood, were dated to early Solomonic time. The Beersheba sanctuary was near a ritual bath or mikveh, a 2.5 by 5 meter stone structure covered with plaster, having a bench along one side, and in the floor a sump. There were several pottery vessels found in the pool, including two fragments of a Karanos with decoration. Beyond the chalk floors, the pool and pottery, 1973 produced another incredible evidence for the temple of Beersheba, a Levitical proportion stone sacrificial altar. A wall in a, in a stratum two storehouse on the east of Tel Beersheba had reused well-smoothed ashlar blocks of calcareous sandstone. The storm, stones formed a large Levitical horned altar. One of the altars, Stones had a deeply engraved decoration of a twisting snake. The serpent, as the symbol of Yahweh and his healing power, was venerated in Israel from Moses' time. The stratigraphic proof of the destruction date of this large altar was confirmed when four stones of well-smoothed calcareous sandstone were found in 1976 under stratum 2 glacis, where they had been buried in the earthen rampart that had lain down with the erection of stratum 2. These four stones helped reconstruct the size and purpose of the altar. These stones were top stones, and they had burnt plant and animal material on their upper surfaces. The size, shape, engraving, and burnt material confirmed that the altar was a Levitical altar, like the altar at a rod. In addition to the altar, a bowl found, it's labeled as a bowl, it's a crater, found in Locust 93, a small front room, of Building 76, a house in the western living area, located across the road from Building 32, also sheds light upon the sacred building destroyed by Hezekiah. The vessel had the word Kadosh, or holy, incised on its side. Aharoni concluded simply that the meaning of the word holy, holiness, shows that the contents of the vessels were dedicated to a sanctuary. The destruction of the Beersheba sanctuary by Hezekiah appears to have been politically motivated and not strictly for religious reasons as well. When Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent his commander and two other high officials to Jerusalem, they spoke to el Yakim in Hebrew, adroitly asking whom the Judahites trust. They insist that the Judahites could not trust in the Lord because Hezekiah had just destroyed the Lord's high places and altars. 
The Bereshava excavation produced evidence for a, for a functioning Israelite sanctuary until the time of Hezekiah's centralization of ritual in Jerusalem in 721 BCE and has given some reasons for its termination. It provided excellent information concerning altars and their use. It showed evidence of a location and necessity of water in temple ritual as at Arad. It did not give, however, any great deal of information about the exact floor plans. After the excavation at Arad, Professor Aharoni excavated for two seasons at Lachish. While ser searching excavation records for archaeological parallels to Arad, he discovered similarities between the solar shrine excavated by the Welcome Marston expedition in the 1930s. The evidence is used by Starkey to demonstrate this was a religious building where its east-west axis, its raised position, a limestone altar located in the court, the wide flight of steps, the plaster drain in the inner room, which had evidently been intended for a libation altar. Through careful examination, Aharoni was able to show that the dating of this temple to the Persian period was not likely. The temple was post-exilic and possibly dated to the first half of the second century BCE. Because of this, Aharoni changed the designation from the solar shrine to Temple 106. The architecture was very reminiscent of Arad. It was not very, it was not some intrusive cult or of foreign architectural extraction. It is of Israelite origins and it's orient, orient, oriented identically to Arad and Beersheba. Both Arad and Lachish have a large courtyard. No large stone altar exists in Temple 106 at the present. A cello, a holy pray, place in the form of a distinct broad room and a central rectangular attitude, the Holy of Holies, reached by three steps. The court and temple were surrounded by rooms, just like a rod. Its proportions are, again, remarkably like the Arad Temple. Many cultic objects were found at Lachish, similar to those at Arad, such as bronze lamps, decorated libation altars, etc. Some incense altars were also found. One altar inscription stated that it was the incense altar of Eosh, the son of Mahalah of Lahish. Another incense altar had a bearded man with upraised arms, which connotated a general posture of prayer. Because of this evidence, it was clear that the Hellenistic Lachish temple gives yet another example of what should be called Israelite temple design, even though it is post-exilic. Further evidence of Israelite sanctuary architecture at Lachish is an Israelite dated building, building 10, which exists under part of Temple 106. It is badly damaged, but the two buildings at Lachish have exactly the same orientation. That is, their axes run east and west, with a slight deviation. This hardly is accidental, since the orientation of a sacral building is evidently of great importance. A limestone altar was found within, which was in what was the holy place. The Li 10 differs slightly from both the Arad Sanctuary and the Hellenistic Lachish Sanctuary, in that the Holy of Holies extends the full width of the building, rather than the cubicle at Arad and Lachish Temple 106. The Holy of Holies contains a circular raised platform opposite the door and should be considered the Bama of the temple. This building was replaced by Temple 106 around the end of the 3rd century BCE. Evidently, the same tradition of worship was maintained in Temple 106, Aharoni stated, which replaced the earlier structure with considerably superior construction. When the contents and plans of both temples are compared with the rod, their probable connection with the inscribed altar is considered as well. All indications point toward a tradition of Jewish Yahwistic worship. Josiah's banishment of all temples except the temple at Jerusalem did not mean that the Israelite temple tradition was lost. After the exile, there is extensive evidence that Jewish communities continued to build legitimate Yahwistic sanctuaries with a continuity of architectural designs from the earliest Israelite times. The greatest was obviously the Temple of Jerusalem, but it included other temples, such as the Hellenistic Temple at Lachish and Beersheba. The 10th century temples at Arad and Beersheba each seemed to spring full-blown architecturally about the same time as Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. The Yahweh Temple in Arad functioned and was apparently held in high regard until the 8th century time of Josiah's Reformation. The Yahweh Temple at Beersheba 
was removed in 721 BCE. A large building with a basement rebuilt in its place. The altar was dismantled, the horns defaced, and the stone used as common building stone. But the Levitical altar remains could be reconstructed and give better understanding. The location of the pool corresponds again to water sources at a rod shedding light on the use of water in all sanctuaries and temples of ancient and post-exilic Israel. All of these architectural features and accoutrements show that these sanctuaries are bridges to the Mount Sinai Theophany. The great Theophany at Sinai became the focus for Israel thereafter. It set the pattern that all revelation and covenant making in Israel followed. The experiences of the fathers foreshadowing those of the descendants. Israel took Mount Sinai in the form of the tabernacle through the rest of their wanderings into the land of promise, the covenant land. They made more permanent Mount Sinai by creating temples and sanctuaries of stone. They did not stray from the form. Each temple had a holy of holies, a holy place, and a courtyard. They built with great care their sacred mountain. LDS people feel they are modern Israel and are fulfilling Isaiah's famous words that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come, ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk as his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This mountain imagery links the architecture of ancient Israel and modern Israel. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had its Mount Sinai at Kirtland, Ohio. The saints built a temple in the manner of the ancient temples because of divine revelation to their prophet, Joseph Smith, Jr. There they had angelic, prophetic, and divine revelations as Moses, the 70 elders of Israel, and the congregation did at Mount Sinai. When they left Kirtland, they built a second temple at Nauvoo, where that prophetic pattern continued. Early Latter-day Saints considered themselves as modern Israel, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation, with a royal priesthood and a new dispensation. They are worshipers of Jesus Christ, led by prophets, building and receiving revelation on their Mount Sinai. As modern Israel set out for their wilderness journey, which led to to Utah, their prophet Brigham Young gave instruction to them as Moses gave to ancient Israel. They were to remember their God, their covenants, and their duties that they had received in their Mount Sinai at Kirtland and in the Nauvoo Temple. Mormons were the camp of Israel. And as Moses led ancient Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, so a living prophet led this modern Israel out of bondage by the hand of their God. Quote, I am he who led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and my arm is stretched out in the last days to save my people, Israel. Unquote. Mormons reached the promised land. They built their mountain of the Lord. They continued to build sanctuaries to the Lord their God and remember their ties to ancient Israel, which is a key to understanding their temples and they can be found in the culture of the ancient te- temple, including three ancient temple sites, Arad, Beersheba, and Lachish.